Okay. Well, welcome to Dr. Cecio webinar. Tonight, uh, we're going to tell you that um, how to keep your patient together. And, and one of the key factor in, uh, in, in the risk ACO is that you want to have a value-based system where you keep your patient close to you. So tonight we're going to show you the SuperDoc app. This doc, uh, this app was developed um, with a lot of people in Palm Beach. They're currently using it, and um, we have uh, we have James Finney, who has masters in healthcare and working with Blue Sky Analytics. We are using it, and he's going to go over the Blue Sky um, SuperDoc Super Doc app. SuperDoc app, is that right? And um, then I'll ask uh, David to see how it has affected in Palm Beach SEO. So basically, we are the sister organization with Palm Beach SEO, and, and Palm Beach SEO is number one SEO in the country. And they, they continue advanced technology, which help them to stay number one. They, they are great in saving. And then we really thank Palm Beach team to help us to continue follow them. So James, take it from here. Dr. Agarwal, so my name is James Franey. Uh, today we're going to be going over the SuperDoc ACO app. Um, so most of you have probably already downloaded this app, I assume, but I you know we'll send this PDF out for everyone in this meeting, just for your reference. So this is just a quick little overview of how you can download the app. Uh, the app's accessible through the App Store for Apple and then the Google Play Store and Android. Pretty self-explanatory, but like I said, we'll send this out. So today we'll be going over two of the core features on the SuperDoc app, as well as um, a new as incentive that we'll be launching for all users in the DACO ACO. And then just a quick reference. So this app is available on Android, iOS, and the internet web browser. So the secure, the secure messaging system, it's a fully encrypted HIPAA compliant messaging system. You can send attachments, um, group messaging features. Um, uh, you can essentially send anything PHI wise to any one, 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 one. Yeah. On the bottom right. I'm sorry? Mutiny? Oh yeah, because you gotta turn it down that. Keep going, ahead. James. Wait, yeah. James. Maybe we'll button. fix that from time to time. See, if you don't right. want to talk, okay. just unmute yourself, please, and then let, let James talk. We'll do the talking. Yeah, so like I was saying, you can send um, any type of attachments. You can send PDF files, spreadsheets. Um, all, all can include PHI, it's HIPAA compliant. Um, very convenient tool as far as communicating with other providers in your network or just staff, ACO staff. I know me personally, I use this almost every day, especially on the support side. And it's, it's very easy if someone just wants to, you know, they take a, a picture of what's going on in their app and they want to just send it through text. This is essentially the same, you know, you just click the application and you can send it just the same, just the same ease as sending a text message. So. Uh, very convenient tool. Highly, highly recommend using it whenever you're sending PHI. So these are the different type of alert types within um, the ADT alerts in the app. Um, this is just a quick reference showing how they're all color coded. It's a color coded structure just for ease of use on the user side. So all of your ER, all of your ER alerts are this um, lightly colored pink color. Um, your inpatient alerts, you have that brownish color, and then any type of discharge alerts will be the color, and then blue will be your transfer alerts. So those previous alerts were all hospital alerts, um, and then we have post-acute alerts as well, which have a different type of color coding. Um, essentially the same thing, you know, you just have, you know, your SNF emissions will be this little icon here. Your SNF discharge, still that green color, just a different icon, just for ease of use. Not for really. users. And then we'll get into the individual workflows for the different actions. Um, so this is kind of a relatively newer action that we added. It's no action taken. Um, I just want to stress that this is 
strictly for outdated alerts and just alerts where no action is really irrelevant to be taken on the individual alert. But um, just want to emphasize it's not to be used for clearing out alerts by any means. So, you know, just not clicking into the alerts, clicking no action taken. You know, there is a purpose for having these preset workflows for the individual actions or individual alerts. And, you know, we just want to make sure that those are being followed. <clears throat> so this is a typical workflow. You see the preset workflow on the bottom left side. This is for um, an inpatient ad alert. Um, you know, you, it's a simple step-by-step -step process. You contact the patient, great, check that off, um, get in touch with the patient or the caregiver. And then the second step would just be getting in touch with the attending physician, sharing rel any relative information regarding the patient's um, prior history. And then at that point, then you want to click completed. Um, you know, there's no requirement that, like the system is not going to prevent an user from just clicking completed, but that is the worst, worst, I don't want to say worst workflow, but um, it's not the recommended workflow. You know, there, there's logic behind why we have these preset workflows and following the logic and ensuring that you're actually doing meaningful work within the system is, um, highly recommended. I, I mean, I can't say required because the system's not going to prevent you from doing it. But I mean, what I can tell you is, you know, we do monitor uh, how the actions are being taken. So, you know, if we get someone just going through all their alerts and just checking off completed or no action taken within, you know, a two to three minute interval, you know, we'll start getting all the fire alarms going off on our end. And then, you know, it's going to I'll have to be reaching out. Someone from the ACO can have to be reaching out so we can just avoid all that and then just, just follow the proper workflow, make everyone's life easier. So discharge alerts, um, you know, similar workflow, definitely different. This is your opportunity that you can schedule a patient and, you know, get that TCM or post-discharge visit in and ultimately hopefully prevent a readmission. And that's why immediate action is strongly recommended, which kind of goes into what we'll talk about later as far as the new incentive program um, is based on um, monitoring whether or not uh, the users are doing that immediate action and then incentivizing all the users to do that immediate action so that we can perform those TCM and post discharge visits and prevent readmission. So this is just a workflow example of a SNF admin. You know, most of these different workflows, the different types of alerts, uh, they, they're all very simple and straightforward. Like I said earlier, I'll send out a PDF of this entire PowerPoint so you'll have reference for all these individual workflows. Um, you know, these preset workflows for the SNF admin and inpatient admin, they're, they're pretty much the same. Um, it's just obviously you have that orange identifier to let you know as a staff member or physician that this is for a skilled nursing facility. HHA admit, um, so home health, similar to other admission alerts. Um, the only difference is essentially reviewing the plan of care with the caregiver um, or even patient if you're able to get in touch with them. And this just helps ensure that you know, you're know you 100% aware of what's going on with the patient um, during their home health and situation. Um, discharge alerts. So again, this kind of goes with all discharge alerts. You want to you try to contact that patient, um, schedule them for a visit, get them in your office. Um, again, this is just hopefully preventing those 30-day readmissions. And then hospice alert workflows. Um, again, very similar to everything else. I don't think there's no any need to re-go over the individual step-by-step -step process. Um, and then that black icon too that you see in the top. So this is just uh, identified patients who have been deceased within the app. <clears throat> Are there any questions thus far as far as any individual alerts or alert workflows? You want to retouch on so James. What I'm trying to figure out is as Docker physician here, once they download this app, what information they're going to get from and which hospital? 
So how do they get going to get home health admission? How are they going to get hospital admission? How are they going to get nursing home admission? So we have, um, so we set up with the HIEs in the area. So essentially, as long as those hospitals, when if the patient is assigned to the individual practices within doctor's ACO, um, and that patient goes to a hospital, a uh, skilled nursing facility, et cetera, um, as long as that's documented within that hospital and sent to the HIE source, you know, that will be sent directly to us in which we can just spit that out into the application in real time and then get delivered straight to your doctor's phone. So in Palm Beach, the call center uses the app or the physician uses the app? Mostly the physician. Mostly the physician. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So uh, James, you know, can you go to the slide please with the breakdown by facility? Yeah. So we, so we can pause here um, for a second and observe. Yeah. And David, correct me if I'm wrong. This was just based on one month of alert data, correct? In June? Yes. So, yeah, the, so the, these were this, this is the whole ACO, is it right? It's not yes, but sir. you want you won't see the whole ACO, you'll see your patients, right? Correct. But we just wanted everyone to see which hospitals and which agencies were participating. And then if one of your patients goes to them you'll get the alert through the app. This is awesome. We've got a lot of home health nurses there, Tegelu Home Health Agency, Kinder at yeah. Home, which is pretty big. Um, this, this is awesome. This is not an all-inclusive list. This, these were essentially a lot of the, you know, where we had majority of the alerts come through too. So can, can you explain me? You know, I'm a physician now. You told me I'm going to get $8 if I do some actionable item on this app. So, so if suppose I get this patient who is in a nursing home, they get the shot, and if I call the patient home and make appointment, that's what you're calling action level uh, action. So, yeah. So this is the new um, the app usage incentive. So this actually went into effect this past Monday, uh, I believe. David, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, um, or Brian Edwards. I believe you sent out the notification. But essentially, so when these alerts come through, um, you, you, we identify, classify them as alert episodes. So you're going to have a patient that submitted, um, that patient can get transferred, um, and then essentially discharge, you know, they can go however many episodes or alerts can be on a patient level, but that will be one episode. As long as the physician or staff member acts on one of those alerts within an episode, within one business day, um, then they will be eligible for that $2 per stop or $4 per physician uh, incentive payment. And then if that same episode, uh, based on BSA data, where we um, classify TCMs that have been um, paid, if that same episode within X amount of days, depending on hit pick code, if it was a seven day or 14 day TCM, um, then that's when we'll provide the additional $8 or $16 to uh, the practice itself. Good. James, can we go back to the last slide? Yes. So I just want to bring to everybody's attention, there's really attractive alerts here on the far right is that you're notified at registration. So, you know, Dr. Haver, maybe you can give us some feedback. Dr. Agrawal is, are these patients that have just been into the ER? And then if you call over, are, are you able to potentially get an appropriate discharge? Uh, it's potentially that these are very, very timely. And um, boy, if you can save a hospital admission, you know, that's $5,000 of savings, you know, 4,000 to you. So, you know, we'll, we'll troubleshoot these to see uh, how timely and, you know, obviously the, the ER uh, notification is much more value than the discharge because you can make much more of a difference. Uh, hey, David and Dr. Desai here. Hello? Hello. Dr. Desai. Uh, don't see the, the hospital I use more frequently. So.
Sub Medical Center. These are the hospitals that participate currently. If if you have a connection at the hospital and you can connect them to Derek from our team, then he can download the alerts directly from the hospital. But this is what we have right now, and and they're slow. So um, you know we usually get like one or two every year. So if we could have your help, Dr. Desai, then we could add your hospital as well. Uh, okay, but like, yeah, I want to add a hospital I use frequently so that I, I know about emergency visit and the patient admission also. Yes, if you could connect us and use your influence, then we're, we're happy to connect to that hospital as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So let me ask you, once you download the app, then how do you, the app connect you with your ACO? Do you send us the username, password, or how do we register in the app? Yeah, so you'll each have your, uh, you reach out to your consultant. Just let them know, typically when they're onboarding you. All right, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, if, if When you do your original training, you should have been provided with an username and go to that first slide and a password. Um, if you forgot your password or if you just never been trained on the platform, just reach out to one of your consultants, whoever your point of contact is. And then essentially we can reset the password or just send you um, credentials if you have not been sent credentials yet. So let so me- your credentials could be your first letter, your first name, your last name, and then at this domain here. Okay, very good. So you say that again, your first letter, username is? The username is the first letter, your first name, and then your last name at this domain here. Okay. And, um, then, and then you can, 99. Re and you can reset the password, is that right? Correct, yes. If you don't remember your password, um, just shoot your point of contact, uh, or you can shoot me an email if you have my email and then we, we can get that taken care of right away. So, so uh, David, can you tell us an, a new, the incentive? Um, have we given? Uh, so, so, if you, if our, when, they, how are they going to get two hundred dollars? So, the first thing is to download the app and then either have the provider or the staff work it in a very timely fashion. You, you only get the incentive if you work it within one day. So, it's important that you either contact the patient, you send over records, or you get them in for the TCM. Um, but uh, the other thing is that you get more money if a physician uses it instead of the staff. So there, there's more value when the doctor knows the patient and they, and they can uh, make a stronger intervention. And then the next part of the incentive is, is you got to use it to, to bill a TCM. So you got to get that patient in. Um, you have to do the phone call within 48 hours, and then you have to successfully bill the TCM. So you, you get significantly more money if you actually uh, do the TCM. So, I mean, the whole purpose here, guys, is number one is we want you to, to build these high paying TCM. It's $250 each time. So that's attractive to you. Um, it's important that you reduce readmissions because readmissions is a double whammy. So every time you save a $5,000 readmission, you get $10,000. And why is that? It's because readmissions is a quality measure. So every time you have a readmission, Medicare cuts your savings for your quality, and then they cut your savings for your cost. So by, by doing these uh, TCM and taking these app actions, uh, you get tremendous, tremendous benefit. David. The other thing, I, I think we announced the incentive. No, not incentive. It's like show money. If, if, the, if Brian or Rochelle come to your office and you show them that you are using the um, app on your cell phone, if you're a physician, you get $200. If you're a nurse practitioner, you get $150 on the spot or maybe within a week with the check. And then if you're a staff, MA of the office and you have an app on your phone and you're using it, you get $100. So that's the additional app we want all doctors, CCOs, staff members, nurse practitioner, as well as physician to, to download the app and uh, show our provider that they're using the app and they get incentive for that. So there are two different incentives here. One is to use it, which I'm gonna do it. And uh, second thing is, and then you 
keep eye on your patient. If they go to hospital, they go to nursing home, they go to hospital, they go to home health care, you know where they are and you know how to bring them back to your office. Uh, Dr. Agar, we'll, we'll send out that second part in writing. Uh, this is what we have so far. Okay. Very uh, good. David, uh, I'm using the, this uh, app for uh, some time now and uh, the good part, uh, I just have to click on the icon and I don't have to enter the password. And uh, my question is, uh, one of my patient is you know, discharged from the nursing home. So I can do TCM on nursing home patient discharge or no? Yes, sir. So you can do TCM on observation discharge? Uh, no, it's a patient was under a home health care agency and they discharged from the service. Okay, so um, you, can do TCM. You, can't, you can't do home health. You so can. You, right, so you need to catch them at the beginning of the home health, right when they get discharged from the hospital or the SNF. So patient is coming next week to see me, then I can just do regular visit or I can add TCM also. If it's been over two weeks since they were discharged from the hospital or SNF, then you do have to bill a regular visit. No, it's only one week. You, I think you're still in good shape. So you can do the TCM also? Yes, sir. Oh, okay, thank you. And the, and the key is, is you know, even if you're a little bit late, um, the most important thing is that you have a quality visit to prevent the next readmission. Okay. So David, just to clarify TCM, so the requirement to connect connect with the doc's patient within 48 hours of discharge, that requirement is waived or not waived? It's not waived. You have to speak with the patient within two business days or your medical record has to have that you attempted twice. And then you meet that part of the criteria. And then, and then you have to see the patient within uh, two weeks. And then it, it depends on the complexity of the patient. So if you, if you have a high complexity patient, and you see them within a week, you can build a higher code. And then if you have a low complexity patient, it actually says moderate, um, then you can build the lower level TCM code within two weeks. So that, there's, a, there's a guide. If you, um, if you reach out to your consultant, they have a very detailed guide. So that beauty about this app is that app will tell you that your patient got discharged and you can call the patient from the app with a telephone number there. And that will qualify that you have called that patient within 48 hours and then set up appointment to see within a week. And then if you do that, then I think reimbursement is almost like more than $2,000, $200. That's right. So, so David, tell, tell me about since the uh, using this app in uh, Palm Beach ACO, how it has affected your savings or quality of care? It's dramatically improved our quality. So, in 2019, um, you know, Palm Beach ACO is in South Florida and, and patients are uh, elderly and um, there, there's a lot of admissions and readmissions maybe from some, some companies that are trying to bill Medicare a lot. But uh, what it did is it put our doctors in a bad position in their quality in readmissions. So um, the physicians really worked hard to, to prevent readmissions. And, the, and what they did was they demanded that we set up the app so that they're notified when their patients are discharged. So they, they were so frustrated that we didn't have the technology to notify them formally. And so they demanded that we set this up. And then what they did is they went from 30% response on the app all the way up to 80% response on the app now. So what, what the result was is that we moved up 30 percentile on our quality measure. So formerly we were, you know, something like 70th percentile and, and now we're at 40th percentile. So there was a direct correlation between the doctors using the app, scheduling TCM, and then their performance and readmissions. That's fantastic. Uh, David, I have another question. Uh, one of my questions you know, lives in the like a uh, no personal home health and the caretaker discharged the patient from her care and uh, she don't know where he went and we can't contact him somehow then uh, what we do because nobody has the information where he gone now so if you're able to connect with them eventually you might be able to do the tcm so what you'd have to do if they were you know i'll use the example of sniff if they were discharged from the sniff and then you tried to call them twice within two business days. And then yeah. you documented that you tried unsuccessfully twice. 
Uh -huh. And then eventually, if you catch up with the patient in the next week or two, then you can bring them in your office and do the TCM. But it, uh -huh. Dr. Desai, if you can't connect with the patient in the next month and you can't get them in your office, there's nothing you can build. Yeah, because we don't have any information where is the patient now. The caretaker don't give any information. She says she don't know where he's going. You know, sometimes our physicians will call the emergency contact when they're in this situation. So, you know, they can, they're very concerned the patient's missing their appointment with their PCP. So uh, uh, some of the doctors will consider that an emergency and call some more folks on the, on the chart. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. So I'm really excited to have this uh, app in, in, in Dr. SEO and may follow the quality measures at Palm Beach SEO. So... David, tell us about um, home health. You know, our home health expenses are going up. So to, to see what can we do, what need to be done, and what a physician need to look before they use their pen to sign up home health. Yes, of course. Stand by. So doctor's ACL has a challenge in home health right now. Uh, you're a saving ACL, you're a risk ACL, but it looks like home health is billing more per capita and you're gonna have to make a choice. Is 2021 gonna be a great year for the home health agencies and your signatures is gonna contribute to that? Or is 2021 gonna be a great year for you and doctor's ACL? You know, unfortunately it's not extremely respectful for the home health agencies to ask you to sign off on home health orders without reviewing them. You know, one of the things we hear is that, you know, they'll ask the physician to sign four weeks into the episode, uh, far too late for you to oversee. But what's interesting is that the home health agency doesn't get in trouble. Uh, the physician is the one that's accountable for all of the information on the page. So just be careful on what you sign off on. You know, if you read the, the OIG records, they're very clear that um, they do find that physicians sometimes they'll, they'll be signing off for um, patients that aren't homebound or, or uh, home health orders that are not medically necessary. So just be careful. Um, you know, if the agencies pressure you, uh, make sure that you still take the time and you review it. And then you make sure that these are, are physician directed home health orders, not home health directed orders. I just wanted to bring to your attention, Emeticis is big in this market and, and maybe they do a good job for you, but they do have a little bit of a history with the OIG. So at least at one point in time, they were making some mistakes and, and maybe billing a little bit too much without justification. So um, just be extra careful with Emeticis and, and know that you, you can't always trust the home health agency to do the compliant thing. And, uh, and definitely make sure you oversee Emeticis just a little bit more. You know, some doctors don't review home health, but boy, this could be some of the highest paid hourly work that you do. So if you're able to review home health and you're able to cross off unnecessary services or reduce the episode from being 60 days to 30 days, not only do you get paid for Medicare about 40 to $50 each time, but you can save $500 on the episode. So this is really great work for you to be able to um, manage your home health, not get in trouble, and earn more money. In 2020, home health changed quite a bit. And, and I'd love for Dr. Haver just to comment as we go, go along is the most important thing is that home health was changed instead of being an automatic 60-day episode is that you can cancel home health or you can order home health only for 30 days. And, and what we found is 80% of your orders should only be 30 days. So don't allow the, the, the agencies to pressure you into six weeks and push it to, to 60 days. You know, make sure that you're uh, crossing off these time periods and, and make sure that you're keeping them under uh, 30 days. <coughs> Dr. Haver, can you go on mute? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, yeah. Um, uh, this is Paul Haver, can you all hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right. Yeah, I think that the, I love the 30 day thing because it, it's a more concise number and it's a smaller and it's something you can really control easier. And, and there's some other things that we'll get to in a minute that 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 make it 
easy to work with within a, a, this uh, 28 or 30 day frame, time frame before moving on. I think it's a great change. Absolutely. Uh, keep keep commenting, Dr. Haver. You're you're doing this every single day. Uh, yes. So yes. Um, one thing that's different about the home health these days is that the diagnosis is less important. So of course, if they put down sepsis and the patient doesn't have sepsis, or if they put down wound care and the patient doesn't have a wound, then then make sure you don't approve it. But the reality is is that even if they add 20 some diagnosis codes, the only thing that's going to happen is the bill can go up 20%. So it's not quite as quite as critical as it was before. And then they don't pay per click on all the therapy visits. Um, as you can see, the PDGM pays based on value. So depending on which diagnosis group the patient falls under, they get pretty much a fixed fee. One important thing is there's a low utilization payment with home health. So if they see the patient only two times, they actually get like a one fifth payment. They get a very, very small payment. So, you know, if the patient doesn't need a whole lot of follow up or they only need, you know, monthly uh, IV or monthly injections, then please pay close, close attention to only do one or two visits total or like three or four visits total because it, it'll pay one fifth of the price. <clears throat> Here's a quick chart of how home health is paid. Again, the most important thing, they, they call early 30 days and they call late 60 days. But if you're able to control the length of stay to be half, that's by far the best way to do it. And then what happens is each one of the, the patients is, is put into one of these clinical groupings. And then some of these groupings pay significantly more than others. Um, so just, just be cautious of what the primary di diagnosis code is. Um, I, I don't think you're going to disagree with them very often, but if it's agree, just cross it off. Um, but they, they do get paid differently based on the group. And then uh, based on the functional impairment, they get paid a little bit differently, which is okay. And then based on the comorbidity, uh, you know, a higher comorbidity patient, as we said, they can get paid 20% more. And then when you sum up this entire chart, this comes out to their HERG, which is HHRG. And that's what their total payment out, amount is. But, you know, the, the bread and butter really is if you can, like Dr. Haver said, keep the patient under 30 days, that's where most of the savings is. And then very, very critical is that if you don't pay close attention and then you actually approve um, a, you know, one time a week, four weeks, uh, you know, one time a week, one week, it ends up being five weeks and it pushes you into the 60 days. So just be very, very cautious. Five or six weeks is paid eight weeks. So watch out for days 31 through 37. So pay very close attention to the intensity. Uh, so our home health experts, and, and we can get some feedback with from Dr. Haver, is they don't find that once a week for four weeks is very impactful. So they see skilled and they see therapy for once a week. Um, that just seems like it draws out the episode and, and it probably doesn't have great clinical outcomes. So what they urge you to do, you know, especially with these chronic diseases like COPD and heart failure is to, to front load them. So, so cross off their recommendation and maybe have the nurse come out there four times a week for a week and then um, twice a week for another week and what you can do is you can have a lower cost home health that's much more effective. Um, Dr. Haver, can you comment here on this part in green? Those were your great words. Uh, it is, and this is going to be my mantra. I, you know, I, when I order home health care, there might be variation. It might, some people might need more, some people might need more, but basically I'm going to go with three W3, then one W1. And that's three visits a week for three weeks. And then one visit a week for one week on that fourth week. And then write an order requiring, ask, telling home health care to, to call your office and schedule an appointment for that patient early in that fourth week. And that'll give you a chance to assess and see if they need any more than that. Because if, the, if home health care continues on into that fourth week, it may, it may be Friday afternoon they contact you, oh, it's about to expire and 
and the patient needs to be continued and you don't, you don't have time to figure out whether they really need it or not or to see the patient before that. And so this 3W3, then 1W1, and then requiring an order that they put it on them. It's their order to call your office to set up that appointment. So it's their responsibility to do that. And now, some again, some people, some patients may need more, like the one above there, the example above, and some people might need less. But that's where I'm going to start from now on. I like to keep it simple, and this is a nice, simple way to do it. And to me, that's the big takeaway of this whole slideshow on home health care. Thank you. And they were right, evaluate and treat, because the home health care agency would, would just do whatever they want to do. Does that make sense but about the the 3W3 and 1W1 and, you know, so, okay. So we, we're fortunate and, and um, Dr. ACO at Palm Beach ACO, we have a couple of experts that are former home health nurses and, and one actually used to own a home health agency for about 10 years. And, and these are the expectations per diagnosis. So uh, the total joints almost always should be completed in less than 30 days. Um, the, the expectation is about 95% of those. Um, any neurological or stroke patient, they also believe that those uh, often are going to be managed within less than 30 days. And, and again, you can front load some of those. Uh, wound surgical, 80% less than 30 days, but you know they were they were acknowledging that around 20% of those don't heal, and, and you might need to get uh, home health for longer. The IV therapy for, for antibiotics, those ones are also typically longer than 30 days. And then COPD, CHF, so your chronic diseases, they're often able to manage those 80% you know, of the time in less than 30 days. But as you can see, if your agencies are pushing you to have six weeks, then uh, you're probably going to be above average on your home health length of stay and home health costs. So it's, it's really cool in our office, you know, we, we, we have a, uh, some staff members and they review the POCs and uh, they do about two or three a day. And um, it's really, it's really great watching their eyes uh, go through the POC. It, it's, it's not usually more than a couple pages, but um, the first thing they do is they look at the start of care here at the top. And then they look at the certification period. Now the certification period is often uh, 60 days, but what they really, really look into is, uh, the treatment, and, and in this case, it's 30 days. So as long as you're seeing the, the treatment is, is going to be uh, less than that four weeks, then you can make sure that the episode's only paid at 30 days and you don't get into that 60 days. They also look at, is this a certification or a recertification? So this is clearly a recertification because it started in February and, and th this period is now April. So you, you'll see them follow the dates. Um, you know, the next thing they'll do is they'll look through the treatment plan and see if they agree with it from a diagnosis perspective. And, and usually it's just like intensity. So, you know, if the patient has COPD and multiple comorbidities, and then you see one uh, W6, you're like, why, you, if the patient's so sick, why are you seeing them uh, not so often? So, you know, they just, they just try to adjust it based on the intensity. And then the final thing is you just want to read through and if there's anything egregious, you know, the common ones is, you know, the patient uh, they'll say eval and treat where they give themselves the authority to, to, to write the order. Um, the second one they'll say is uh, other physicians can add to the order, right? So they, they say that any specialist can, can add, uh, which, which is not appropriate. It really should be the PCP that, that dictates the order. Um, and then uh, the third one they'll often put is patient expected to, to have multiple certifications. So that's up to you. It's not up to the agency to say that. Uh, well before the assessment. So just, just, be, just be cautious. You'll see some funny things in here and, and you don't have to be an expert. All you need to do is just get your hands dirty. And then if you have any, any POCs that you'd like to send our way, James talked about how to send it securely in the app. You can send us the, the patient information and, and we'll probably have an expert close by that they can review and we can write you right back. So definitely don't be afraid to get your hands dirty on these. And if you have any advanced questions, send them our way. This is one where our pro was really upset is um, if they're, if they're going to go twice a week for six weeks, 
um, once a week for two weeks. They felt like this one should have definitely been done um, twice a week for four weeks. So it was unnecessary for them to go uh, the six weeks. This is one where they found that the skilled services were unnecessary. So why does the patient continue to get skilled if there was no falls, no injury, and no hospitalizations? So if the patient needed therapy, then you should cancel the home health and then you should order outpatient or home therapy. And, and that's a fraction of the home health cost. Home health requires skilled nursing. So in this case, they said that the skilled nursing was medically unnecessary and uh, they, they canceled the home health and then they, they ordered therapy independently. I'll let Dr. Haver make some comments, but you know, some important notes is that home health should always be physician directed. Um, there's a couple comments here is the patient could have a long-term insurance policy that pays for AIDS and, and other services that may help the patient. Same thing with the VA program and Medicaid. So there are some ways that you can have services for the patient where they don't have to, to go directly to Medicaid. And then um, another common one is patients with MS and Parkinson's. Home health is often not the solution. You know, you can get Part B services and, and, and not be so expensive and, and kind of build under the appropriate category. David, uh, the, uh, to, one of the important things to me is that physician directed, they need to be directed by you, uh, the, their primary care doctor. Some orders will say that you give permission for these to be renewed or recertified by any doctor who's involved in their health care. And that's not appropriate. It's not appropriate for the, the orthopedist to, to do this. The orthopedists don't want to do it anyway. But um, it needs to be you that's doing and don't sign orders that allow them to use a different physician or their medical director, say, to, uh, to uh, recertify if you, if, if you don't think it's appropriate. So David, can you show that slide again? The one which is a uh, choice between you and the home health. You know, the expense has gone $200. Uh, tell me which one. The one which showed the expense. The home health has gone to $770. The early one. The first one. Oh, got it. This one. This is an incredible slide. I think every, every, every physician and, uh, and doctor says you need to remember this slide. You know, this is incredible. That, mean, <laughs> that means if people don't listen to Dr. Paul Haver, that they, we were not going to celebrate in a two. Um, this is, you know, we're not saying don't do home health, but we, what we're saying is watch the home health expense. So if we do a 30 days order for home health and then see the patient before you recertify, that will be a great strategy. Wouldn't you say that, Dr. Haber? Yeah, yeah. The whole idea with home health care is to reduce expenses. And it would be one thing if the home health care expenses were going up and the hospitalizations were going down as, as, a, as a result of, and I suppose to, that's what's supposed to actually happen. When uh, home health care was invented back when I was a young, when I was a medical student, really, uh, they started doing it uh, to make it to reduce hospitalizations. Now, if they're, and if they're reducing hospitalizations, that's fine. But I don't, I don't uh, know that that's giving us that kind of a benefit at all. And it's just the home health care company is taking advantage, probably. of So, David, this seven hundred seven dollar is it because of the longer than thirty days home health? or it is more intensified home health. Can you, can, is there any idea we can figure this out? It's predominantly long length of stay. Oh, okay. So that Dr. Basio has a, a long, a significantly longer length of stay. And you know, one of the things is, is like Dr. Haver said, is just demand that you see the patient within the first week and then demand that you see the patient within four weeks. 
because you're not able to really make an assessment unless you see the patient and then you can you can cross off or shorten the length of stay. So let's see, that's a great presentation. I think I'm impressed. The data really show here that we got to do something about it. It just gone at least uh, from uh, 500 to 700. It, would you say that 500? This the point lower point is uh, uh, about 550, right? To 7, 707. Yes, Very sir. good. So go ahead and ask question. We open for discussion. Everybody unmute yourself and ask question or you can uh, chat, put the question on chat and David and Paul will take those questions. Um, I think um, app is a great thing to do. If, please download the app. If you don't have password, just call call, uh, call your provider rep and we can get you the password and now all, not only them, when they come in, they can give you retraining too. Uh, just uh, Dr. Desai, a question for Dr. Hever. Uh, sometimes you no know, patient, you know, family members, you no know, ask for the more, uh, you know, more care for a longer time. Then how we can handle this? Well, well, if it's appropriate, home health care and they they need it. Uh, we've got one guy who has uh, decubitus ulcers and he weighs six hundred and fifty pounds and he's at home and we can't stop home health care on him. Is there's there's nothing else he can't come to the office. There's nothing else we can do. We, we uh, and and it, that kind of a situation. There's you, there's sometimes a situation, but you just can't stop it. You do the best you can. If you address the issue and work towards uh, reducing it, it will you will re reduce and control home health care better. You can't solve solve them all, and there's some exceptions to it that are difficult and. And there's only so much you can do about that in that, in that kind of situation. Does, does, that, does that help? No, my question is sometimes no, physician thing is not necessary to continue. But oh, still not the family wants to do it. And oh, how they can handle it. If you, you just have, I, I think that you have to, you tell the patient that it's, I'll, sometimes with situations like this, I'll tell patients, or I have my nurse tell the patients that we can get in trouble for ordering something that's medically inappropriate, oh. you know, and and sort of put it on the legal end of it. But you, you just have to put your, you know, sometimes you just have to put your, and find other things that they need. If if uh, figuring out how to get a home aid to them, that's a lot of times that's what they need. They just need some help, or they're lonely and they need some some community intervention or something. Uh, try to find out something else that that will satisfy their needs and and uh, take care of things for them. Uh, to some degree, you got to put your foot down, but uh, the more you can, more you can work with them and find something else to substitute for that, the better. I think. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Right. And there are two questions, David. One is, can you read that question from chat and answer the questions? So you can find out who is the ordering physician in Blue Sky, or you can call the agency and, and, they'll, and they'll share that information with you. But our team brings home health orders to your office, and, and right at the top, it always has the ordering physician. And we've had a few doctors, they'll call the ortho, and they'll say, hey, I'm the primary. I expect to be authorizing these orders. You know, Can you please refer to me? And you just you just have to set the expectation that the primary is responsible for doing this and not the specialist. One is asking for how to bill for signing the home health orders. I think the code you showed them, the right. Yes, and then you just you just want to have a note documenting that you did it. In our office, we have our, our staff does this automatically. Uh, they know that when when they get these orders signed from me, they know automatically to, to file the charges. Um, I don't ever have to think about it, and they do it. So I, I like the idea, like three times for three weeks, and one time one week, and then come and make appointment in my office. I and, think that that will yeah. clear that will clear the air. 
and and put in the orders for them to call and sit, make sure that appointment is set up is put it on them to do that because otherwise if it's put on me i'll forget to do it and, and everything and uh, so yeah so the uh, brian and rochelle are you on the on the line here yes we're here dr agua so let's make a set up a goal in the next 30 days and at least 90 percent of our provider have app and using it how about that and then if, if you're able to give them $200 per, per provider by showing you they're using the app and they know how to use the app and they're saving money and keeping patient away from the hospital and bringing patient to their office. I have a question. Um, is, the, is the SuperDoc ACO 2.0 the app? SuperDoc. Yes, that's it. Yourself. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. So, any, any, if there are no further question, we, we appreciate everybody joining us during this time. We appreciate James, appreciate David, and uh, Paul. Um, we are really moving towards um, really high tech technology to create a low quality, low, low cost, high quality care. So if we don't use these tools, uh, we might, may not able to prove Medicare that we are, we are what we are. And so please use the new technology. And if you need some help to learn the extra thing, we will spend time with it. So this to 2020, <clears throat> 2021, if home health price costs, when, when do you think we, if we make the changes now, so when do you think we'll see the dip in the home health? If we make the change this quarter, maybe the next quarter we'll see the difference? It'll go fast. So that report there, <laughs> that report there is uh, one quarter in 2021 and three quarters in 2020. So it'll move fast. So if you make the changes now, we'll, we'll see it in the data in fall. There was an, David, there's another question, I believe, on chat. Okay, so I, I just want to be really honest. I, I just had a great friend of mine lost his license because he was pushed by a DME vendor on uh, some patients to, to sign off uh, and he hadn't seen the patient. And, and the DME vendor was very pushy and he just, he caved. But the way the government looked at it was that he was the expert, you know, similar to Dr. Desai. The family, they're, they're laymen. They're not licensed. They don't get in trouble. So if they pressure you to sign off on something, or if the agency pressures you to sign off on something, they're not accountable. And, and every single regulatory agency is going to say, you as the licensee, you're the one that signed off. So, um, you know, it's important that if the agencies ask you to review them timely, that you also sign them timely. But if they're late, uh, you can absolutely refuse. And, and maybe what you can do is you can say, um, I wrote you a letter. Uh, this is the last time I will sign it late. From now on, you need to get the patient in my office and you need to deliver these POCs uh, within one week. And then from that point on, if they're outside of it, then you just refuse to sign. But um, you're taking a risk by, by letting them dictate what you sign. It's really up to you. So nothing bad going to happen to you if you don't sign. I mean, that's right. So, yeah. So legally, they cannot go after you that why you're not signing home health. You will prove, you haven't seen the patient, you want to see the patient, and this is what you think needs to be done. So nothing bad can happen to you. You are the boss. You are the one ordering the order, not the home health uh, services. Okay. David, I have one more question. Uh, Sometimes you know, the hospital physician you know, send the patient for the you know, home health care agency and uh, they didn't inform me that the you know, patient has you know, getting the service. And then the agency sent the paper to, for me to sign. So I can refuse to sign because I was not notified. Yes, sir. Now, you, you want to develop a relationship with the agency. So it's very common for the hospital to order the home health and then they expect you to sign it. 
-hmm. but you're happy to do so if they bring the patient in within a week and then you can make sure it's appropriate. You can maybe uh, shorten the length of stay and then everything goes well. The bad thing is when they bring it to you late and they expect you not to review it and sign whatever they recommend. Okay, thank you. So that's the beauty about TCM. If you do the TCM, you can evaluate their order, they can evaluate their home health, they can evaluate uh, uh, physical therapy and everything else. So, I mean, I think this app will really tremendously help you if you start using it and start getting patients in your office and our support staff can help you too to bring that patient back to an office within about a week. Yeah, I also think the app is excellent and uh, it's very easy to use it. Even I don't have to put the password. Just awesome, click, awesome, very just good. Click it and uh, all the information in front of you. So very good, thank you everybody. We will take off and uh, we will do something soon. Uh, David, when is our next meeting? Uh, we probably not scheduled right it. now, so we, we do these yeah, one at a time, so we'll get another yeah. one on the books. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you all, appreciate yeah. it. Good night, bye bye. Good night, bye. bye.